This week, Truth to Ponder comes to you from On the Road. We're spending some time with some family. (laughs) And guess where we are? This is Truth to Ponder with Bob Bierman. Carry me back to old Virginia. There's where the cotton and the corn and potatoes grow. There's where the birds warble sweet in the springtime. There's where this old dark is hard and long to go. And welcome to the Monday edition of Truth to Ponder. I'm your host, Bob Bierman. We are recording the program in the little town of Chilhowee, Virginia. Now, Chilhowee is located in the extreme southwest portion of the state. You would never know that you're in a a state that has kind of gone liberal over the years when you're around Chilhowee. We have family here. So I kind of apologize for some of the background noise you're going to hear. We don't really have the best of a studio arrangement in front of us for the next several days and, and so I hope you'll bear you'll bear with me and and forgive me for some of the issues we may have in producing the program this week I thought about several things I would talk about for the program today but every time I tried to sit down I thought about maybe looking at last week's press conference not press conference but the insidious town hall by President Joe Biden. Well, it's been pretty well documented on television and other sources and other radio programs. I don't need to add much to what already has been said. It was an embarrassment. And I I, I really feel sorry for the first time. I really feel sorry for Joe Biden. In spite of all the damage I think he's done to this nation over the years, he is an elderly individual. And I believe that those that run him, the puppet that he has now become in his later years in life, in watching part of that, it was so sad I couldn't watch. And I know others have played some highlights, but I'm not even going to bother. There is absolutely no doubt in my mind that the man has got some mental health issues cognitive issues. Funny, they were trying to go after Donald Trump, saying maybe he needs to be checked for cognitive issues, but the same people screaming to the rooftops, you know, three years ago about uh, the mental health or cognitive issues of Donald Trump are eerily silent and don't say a word about the obvious mental decline in the last six months of the puppet president. Now, I will go on record, and I will say this again, and I'll keep saying it. We spend a lot of time in Georgia. We also spend a lot of time in Florida. For me, in my life, I came to the state of Georgia in 1975. That's when I moved to Georgia, and I spent pretty much, with only a few exceptions, most of my adult working life in a little area in northeast Georgia and western South Carolina where I did most of my work. There was a time that I worked in metro Atlanta. And so I understand north Georgia intimately. I have built radio stations all over the state of Georgia and in the upper part of South Carolina and even into North Carolina. So I know the region quite well. I've watched it grow. I've watched it change. And, and I've, so I have a feeling, whether it's Metro Atlanta, whether it's Augusta, whether it's Savannah, whether it's Brunswick, whether it's Southwest Georgia, like uh, towns like Bainbridge or Albany, I've been all over the state. And the one thing I can tell you with certainty, Joe Biden did not win legitimately the state of Georgia. And I'm beginning to increasingly feel comfortable in saying the following. There was cheating in the state of Georgia. And I think the Secretary of State was somewhat aware of it, but recognized because of his failure as the Secretary of State, he would have to show his incompetence if the fraud is revealed. 
Besides that, he was a never Trumper anyway, so he didn't care. And frankly, why would he care? And there lies the problem, at least in my opinion. Until it came time for the two Senate races. And then the two, shall we say, establishment Republicans went down in flames. Sad but true. But see, at that point, what could Brad Rassenberger do about it? If he tried to intervene now when January rolled around, January the 5th, for that election, if he had tried to fix it then, it would have been obvious what he had failed to do for the election in November. He was caught. See, he made deals with Stacey Abrams and Democrats, all related, of course, to the pandemic, for mail-in ballots, Uh, Nobody really checking signatures on ballots. There's so many irregularities in Fulton County, Georgia, more than enough in just a handful of precincts to overturn the election. Because remember, Joe Biden only won by less than 11,000 votes in the state of Georgia. And there are irregularities in the mega thousands in, in Fulton County. I've still never from Brad gotten a good explanation of all the ballots that magically appeared out from underneath tables after everybody was told to leave the arena in downtown Atlanta where ballots were being counted after the phony water leak story came out. Hey, we got a water leak. Everybody got to leave. We'll do it tomorrow. Bye. And as soon as all the Republican observers are gone, as soon as they thought the media was all gone, out come all these roll-around suitcase carts full of ballots, thousands of them. There's even video that makes it appear that some of the ballots were counted one, two, and maybe even three times. Same ballots, all for Biden. And you're going to tell me that somehow in the middle of the night after everybody was gone, The lead that Trump had, even in Fulton County, vanished in a matter of a couple of hours because of the conveniently stored ballots under the table. You're going to tell me in Wayne County, Michigan, and Detroit, that all those ballots that suddenly appeared at 2 o'clock in the morning, all for Biden, were legitimate. You're going to tell me in Arizona the same thing. How about Pennsylvania? How about Wisconsin? Why is it that all those states had one thing in common? When nobody was looking, in the wee hours in the morning, magical ballots appeared from nowhere, literally nowhere, and suddenly Joe Biden just magically, suddenly begins to take a tiny lead in those states. Did Joe Biden win any of those states by massive margins? No. Tiny margins, tiny margins. And this guy is supposed to have had the most votes of any presidential candidate in history. I doubt it. I am convinced, and I'm, I'm saying this so carefully because I've got other things to talk about in the program today, but I'm telling you that I, I wake up at night and I think to myself, what in the world is going on? What in the world is going on in our nation? I would have laughed at anybody 20, 25 years ago that talked about what we now call the deep state. Truly, I would have. I would have said, you know, that's not true. We have, you know, some decent people in office. We got some strange states. We got a few strange leaders. But, you know, I've met a lot of government bureaucrats, and I have. And there's some that are actually nice people, believe it or not, that I've worked with over the years, way back when, primarily in the 90s. But those are in agencies like the Federal Communications Commission. They're the engineering people. They, they, they tend not to be very political. And so when you look at people that are long-term in, in the State Department, long-term in the IRS, long-term in the Justice Department. They have developed their own shadow government in these agencies. And they really believe that they're the ones in charge. Look at the NIH, or shall I say the 
the national, you know, Fauci's organization. There's a man that's not been held accountable, and I've got a story in front of me I want to share in just a minute about the the, the virus. Some of these things that just kind of get tossed to the side. You can't trust the mainstream media anymore because they, they're nothing but state-run propaganda media. You know it and I know it. Whatever credibility CNN once had back in the 80s and early 90s is long gone. It vanished somewhere during the Bush administration, totally. And now they are so overboard and so deluded that the Bible is so correct. Their delusion will be so complete. And it is when it comes to MSNBC and, and CNN and the others. They can watch Biden do his... You know, how do you... I don't have any audio clips in front of me. I haven't had time to put some of this together, just trying to put a little temporary studio together to record. But I listened to Biden just losing his place in his mind and just warbling all over the place and trying to tie some words together, get a collective thought together. And he couldn't do it. He just couldn't do it. And yet you have all the pundits at CNN and MSNBC and ABC and CBS and the you know, Washington Post, New York Times. What an incredible town hall meeting given by President Biden. He was so decisive. No, he was not. What CNN and the rest count on, the ratings were so dismal that nobody ever watched. And if all you ever watch is NBC News at night with whoever's doing it now, what is it, Lester Holt? I haven't paid attention in so long. I got so disgusted watching the nightly news on NBC or ABC or CBS. I just have walked away and I refuse to put that poison into my brain because I know that they're basically state-run propaganda media that would make Joseph Goebbels happy and proud. We no longer have a press. And so they're all talking about what a great job that he did. If President Trump or President Bush or President Reagan back in the day had just one of the dozens of fumbles that Biden had in that town hall meeting, you would never hear the end of it. It's like I said last week. When Jerry Ford, you know, fell and bumped his head, he was laughed at for the rest of his life. Biden trips three times going up the airplane stairs to Air Force One, and we're told, oh, it was a windy day. He was blown over by the wind. And I'm thinking, I'm looking at that video. I don't see evidence in his jacket or his hair of a lot of wind blowing. It's just a lie. Everything our government is doing now when it comes to the virus is a lie. There's some truth in there. But see, there's so much they're trying to cover up, especially Dr. Fauci. Dr. Fauci now is, you know, he's on the warpath, you know, talking about disinformation and they're just trying to ruin my reputation. Well, you ruined your own reputation, you fool, when you started lying to the American people. The man has no credibility, but he's Biden's choice. No, he's not Biden's choice. He's the people that control Biden's choice to run, you know, the entire thing for the pandemic. If you go back to just January of this year, there's a doctor by the name of Jonathan Latham, PhD, and he introduced a term called the pandemic virus industrial complex. Kind of sounds like uh, when Eisenhower left office, he warned about the military industrial complex, and he meant it, and he was right. And this new term, the, the pandemic virus industrial complex, describes the academic, military, and commercial complexes that are, that are driving the pandemic agenda and are doing a really great job in obscuring a lot of the facts that indicated that SARS-CoV-2, SARS-CoV-2, was a man-made virus. The pandemic industrial virus, it definitely is. And all the research on much of this stuff was funded by none other than the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases under the direction of Dr. Anthony Fauci, though he gets in front of you and says, you're lying, Rand Paul. I, I never funded. Yes, he did. 
Millions of dollars to the EcoHealth Alliance are indisputable. And where that money went to Wuhan is indisputable. Period. End of discussion. Yet he is convinced that he, look, the man has never been held accountable in all his decades of government service. And he gets paid 400, he gets paid more than the president. Highest paid government employee, Dr. Fauci. There's a guy that put together a video a while back. His name is David Martin. And he put together a video that I I took a brief look at. It's not too long. He's been in the business of tracking patent applications and approvals way back since 1998. And the reason he does that, he has a company called MCAM International. They're an innovation risk management corporation. They're the world's largest underwriter of intangible assets used in finance. In other words, they're the kind of people that raise money for your patent so you can build something. MCAM has also monitored biological and chemical weapons treaty violations on behalf of the United States government back in 2001 when we had the anthrax scare. Remember that? According to Martin, there have been more than 4,000, not 400, not 40, 4,000 patents related to the SARS coronavirus. And his company has done a lot of comprehensive review of the financing of research involving manipulation of the coronaviruses that gave rise to what's called SARS, or Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, as a subclade of the beta coronis family. Now, a while back in his testimony to the ACU, he reviews some of the most pertinent data showing that SARS-CoV-2 is not a novel coronavirus at all. It didn't come from bat droppings in a cave to people. No, it's rather a man-made virus that has been in the works for decades. When you look at 120 patented pieces of evidence to suggest that the idea of a novel coronavirus was just a fraud. He claims there is no no novel coronavirus It's not been novel for over two decades. Now, here's something that he pointed out. And I don't have a lot of time to get into all of this because it it can get too technical on radio. But let me just give you this much. Up until 1999, coronavirus patents were all in the veterinarian sciences. Okay? Up until 1999, coronavirus patents were all in the veterinarian sciences. The first coronavirus vaccine that used an S-spike protein was patented by, ooh, could it be Pfizer? Wait a minute. The first coronavirus vaccine using the S-spike protein patented by Pfizer in January of 2000? Look it up, patent number 6372224. It was a spike protein virus vaccine for canine coronavirus. You can look it up. It's right there at the Patent Office website. Now, Ralph Barrick, remember that name? Yeah, he's the guy at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, one of, you know, Fauci's good friends. Along with Peter Daszak of the EcoHealth Alliance. See, these people keep coming back. See, Ralph Barrick's work on, on rabbit cardiomyopathy, gee, where do we hear... Uh, myopathy becoming a problem, cardiomyopathy. Oh, yes, with young people taking the vaccine. Oh, that, that's just got to be, we all know that's just coincidental. And then on the canine coronavirus in Pfizer's work to identify how to develop an S-spike protein vaccine target candidate. Well, neither the coronavirus concept of a vaccine nor the principle of the coronavirus itself as a pathogen of interest with respect to a spike protein. It's been around for 22 years based on patent filings. Now, here's where it gets a little dicey. According to Martin, Fauci and the NIAID found the coronavirus to be a potential candidate for HIV vaccines. And in 99... Fauci then funded research at, where else? The University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where Barrick happens to have his lab. 
And there they were just going to create an infectious replication defective coronavirus targeted for human lungs. Ooh. Now that patent for that coronavirus to attack human lung cells was filed in April of 2002. Well, Bob, that's that's 19 years ago. Yeah. In other words, according to those that are looking at the patents, we created SARS under patent number 7279327. Or maybe we can be more accurate. Fauci and the University of North Carolina, they did it. And several months after that patent filing, a SARS outbreak in Asia occurred. You know, I remember reading early on when I'm doing my emergency management work. For those that have listened to this program for a while, you know that I, I've worked in emergency management over the years, and I came out of retirement to help a large county in their COVID-19 response. Because, you know, we didn't know anything in February of last year. I started hearing about this really in all earnest in January of 2020. And I got a call to consider coming out of retirement. And so I did, thinking that we're dealing with something just unusual. And it's like anything in emergency management, you deal with it. But over time, as I started looking at what we call dashboards and information, I'm going, we're not being told the full truth. There's something that is clearly incorrect. And there's a changing narrative. And I finally got so disgusted, I left. I couldn't be a part of this fraud any longer. See, the patent, that 727-9327, it lays out a specific gene sequencing. The fact that we knew that the ACE receptor, you know, those things that make you sick, the binding domain, the spike one, spike protein, and other elements of what we now have come to know in this pathogen we call, you know, COVID-19 was not only engineered, but could be synthetically modified in the laboratory using nothing more than gene sequencing technologies. In other words, taking computer code and turning it into a pathogen. And all that funded in the early days, exclusively funded, as a means by which we could harness coronavirus as a vector to distribute an HIV vaccine, allegedly. Now, what Martin also points out, And he's monitored this for quite a while. He's monitored biological and chemical treaty violations since 2001, following the anthrax attacks, if you remember that, in the fall of 2001. An enormous number of bacterial and viral pathogens were patented through, oh, I feel like I need a ta-da or a drum roll here, National Institutes of Health, the NIAID, yeah, Mr. Fauci, the U.S. Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases, the USA MRIID, and all their collaborators. And this guy's concern was that a coronavirus was being seen not only as a way to manipulate for use as a vaccine, what they call vector or or distribution way to get something to happen in the human body, but it was also being considered clearly as a biological weapon candidate. You know, the Chinese, they don't have any reason not to do that. And before the SARS outbreak in China, we're talking 20 years ago, Martin reported those concerns way back then. You can imagine, you know, having, you know, pointed out earlier there was a problem on the horizon and nobody listened. In April of 2003, after the SARS outbreak in China had occurred, The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention tried to file a patent for the entire gene sequence for the SARS coronavirus. By the way, by the way, that's a patent number 7220852. Look it up. This is a violation of United States law where you cannot patent a naturally occurring substance. So if this was truly something that had just jumped from a bat to a human and then infected everybody in a wet market in China and then became the scourge of the world, how do you patent something that's natural? Now, 
when you take these patents together, everything becomes extremely problematic because if you own both, then you are you have a cunning advantage to be able to control 100% of the provenance of not only the virus, but also its detection, meaning you have entire scientific and message control. And see, the CDC back then tried to justify the patent by saying they were being sought in order to ensure that everybody would be free to research coronaviruses. But if you do a little digging, as any good reporter used to do, they don't do it anymore at the Times or the Post or CNN or anywhere else. The U.S. Patent Office rejected the patent on gene sequencing as unpatentable because it's 99.9% identical to a coronavirus that had already been discovered in, you know, in nature. The CDC paid an appalling fine, and again in 2007, to keep the application private. In other words, they had an appeal fine. They didn't want anybody to know. They, they spent a lot of taxpayer money to keep everybody in the dark. In the end, the CDC overrode the patent examiner's rejection and secured it in 2007. Now, let me see if I understand this. If you're trying to put information out there for the world to use, why would you pay all this money and fees to keep it a total and absolute secret? You know, here's another one that comes out. This goes back to April of 2003. I mean, this is not stuff that, you know, this is stuff that's been really concerning to me. April 2003, three days after the CDC filed its patent for the SARS coronavirus, a company called Sequoia Pharmaceuticals filed a patent on an antiviral agent for the treatment and control of infectious coronavirus. Wait a minute. So the CDC, I'm just trying to understand this, and, and this is where I need your help, folks. The CDC files a patent on a SARS coronavirus way back in 2003, 18 years ago. And three days later, we find there's a magical treatment or supposedly a treatment. Now, if I'm just going to be a guessing kind of guy, I'm going to figure out there was a working relationship somewhere between all the parties. I mean, between Sequoia Pharmaceuticals that happened to be founded in 2002, the year before all this, they, in that one year of history, develop an antiviral therapeutic with a special focus <laughs> on drug-resistant viruses. And its lead invent- investors, the people that throw the money in it, it's called the Wellcome Trust. There's other issues with their patent, Sequoia's patent. It was actually issued and published before the CDC patent on SARS coronavirus had ever been granted which didn't happen until 2007, and the CDC had paid to keep the application private. So Martin has his quote. So the degree to which the information could have been known by any means other than insider information between those parties is zero. It is not physically possible for you to patent a thing that treats a thing that had not yet been published because the CDC had paid to keep it secret. Martin claims that this is really the definition of a criminal conspiracy, racketeering, and collusion. This is not a theory because the evidence is pretty clear. You cannot have information in the future and form a treatment for a thing that did not exist. RICO, you've heard of that term. They use that against organized crime. And this RICO pattern, which is what they use, was established in April of 2003 for the first coronavirus, was played out exactly the same schedule when we see the SARS-CoV-2 show up. And then we have another company called Moderna getting the spike protein sequence by phone from the Vaccine Research Center at NIAID prior to the definition of a novel subclade. That's a fancy term, but in other words, before we ever call this a a novel virus, they're already getting the sequence. There's other things that occurred. Let's go back to 2008. Here's another one. There's a company called Abilinx, now part of uh, Sanofi, 
filed a series of patents detailing what we've been told are novel features of the SARS-CoV-2. And it talks about the ACE2 receptor binding, the, the spike protein, all these things. And those patents were ultimately issued in, in 2015. Additional patents between 2016 and 19 issued to these companies covering the RNA strands and the subcomponents. Way back between 08 and 17, a series of patents were filed by a long list of people. And it's like, you know, this is, I, I'm not, this is such a long list, I'm not going to read it. But in the United States and overseas, and these patents detail an ever single attribute that is supposed to be unique to SARS-CoV-2. You know, the novel bat coronavirus kind of stuff. And the paper, this paper that was written a while back has been used often to identify so-called novel coronaviruses that is SARS-CoV-2. Now, if it's so novel, why are there 73 patents describing these elements? The pandemic virus industrial complex. And here's the worst part. I said a long time ago that when it all comes out, you can just count on one thing. Follow the money. Follow the money. Dr. Barrick is one of the few people who has profited significantly from the pandemic, which he appears to have been part of creating. Another is Fauci. The same drug companies that hold patents on not-so-novel SARS-CoV-2 are also making big profits from the COVID shots. 2015, Dr. Peter Daszak, head of the EcoHealth Alliance, that funneled all these dollars from Fauci to Wuhan, which Wuhan, you know, is the place where we say this virus came from. And Fauci denies, I never funded gain-of-function research, but he did. The man is a liar that should be literally fired and arrested for mass murder. We need everybody to start understanding the need for medical countermeasures such as a pan-coronavirus vaccine. The key driver, this is from... This is from something written by Dr. Peter Daszak. A key driver is the media and economics will follow the hype. And listen to this. We need to use that hype to our advantage to get to the real issues. Investors will respond if they see profit at the end of the process. In other words, in 2015, Dr. Peter Daszak, and I've seen the video where he says we need to increase the public understanding of the need for medical countermeasures, such as a vaccine. And the driver is going to be the media, ha <laughs> CNN, MSNBC, New York Times, and now Facebook and Twitter. And the economics, the investors, the money boys will follow. And these investors will, will respond if they see a big profit in the end. Doesn't it sound like what we're facing right now? Once again, Martin says, Dr. Martin makes it very clear. There wasn't a lab leak. There was an intentional bioweaponization of a spike protein to infect and inject into people to get them addicted to a pan-coronavirus vaccine. This has nothing to do with a pathogen that was released. And every study that's ever been launched to try to verify a lab leak, in other words, a leak, is a red herring. If there are all these patents on all this stuff for all this time, all issued before 2019. All they prove is it was actually not a release or an accident. Some people are beginning to think some of this was intentional. He asked the question, 2017 and 18, the National Institute of Health have to take ownership of a patent they've already had rights to held by the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. How did they need to file a certificate of correction to make sure that it was legally enforceable? Because there was a typographical error in granting the, the thing in the first place? No, they needed to make sure that not only did they get it right, but they needed to make sure that every typographical error that was contained in the patent was correct on the single patent required to allow the development of a vaccine. Wow. 
which was shared between the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill and a little company called Moderna in November of 2019, before the pandemic was ever declared. A month before we ever even heard about it, they're already beginning to work on a vaccine for this patented virus. See, the more we learn, the worse it gets. The plans for our current day pandemic were laid out a decade ago. The new normal was coined by Merck way back in January of 2004, called a SARS and bioterrorism, emerging infectious diseases. That's a conference that they held, Merck, you know, a pharmaceutical company. The term has now been branded in a campaign by the WHO, the World Health Organization, the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board for all this pandemic nonsense, and they've been lying to us too. And by the way, just in case you didn't know, Good old Dr. Fauci, who denies everything, is on the board of directors of the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board of the WHO. And guess who else? Dr. Chris Elias, president of the Global Development Program, uh, and he's paid by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And there's also a Dr. George Fu Gaio, a director general of the Chinese CDC and a Chinese Communist Party member. When you look at all the facts in front of you, you're going to tell me, yeah, yeah, this this was just an accidental release because some worker somewhere in China went into a cave and stumbled upon some bat droppings, came down with the virus, came back to a wet market, infected everybody in the world has been paying ever since. And somehow we magically, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to share some more thoughts on the other side. I'm already so late for the break, I'm embarrassed. But I'm going to go ahead and take the break. And I'll finish this conversation and kind of introduce where we're going to be going to tomorrow. But I I wasn't even planning to spend this much time. But the more I read this, the more I read this, the angrier I get. And I also worry about this so-called vaccine. Is it really what we need? If you believe in what we're trying to do here, and I'm sorry for just lecturing for so long, and I hope I didn't bore you, but I, if you listen to what I was trying to tell you, these are the things you're not finding anywhere else, but these are the things you can find for yourself. They're not hidden. They're right there at the U.S. Patent Office. They're right in front of us. But the news media has been negligent in their job. I'm just one guy trying to do the best that I can to discern the information that I, I read through every day. I try to go through it and take out the nonsense from the real. There's a lot of nonsense that comes out there, too. A lot of it designed to just send us down rabbit holes. That's what this program is all about. Would you consider a small gift to keep us going on radio, on shortwave? Some bills come due next week. And even though we're away for a few days, we'll be back in the not-too-distant future in plenty of time for the first. We're just spending a little time up here getting some things done. Would you pray for us, number one? Pray for us. And if you can support us, you can mail it to Ancient Word Radio. That's our parent, you know, Ancient Word Radio, 21 Berkshire Lane, 21 Berkshire, B-E-R-K-S-H-I-R-E, 21 Berkshire Lane, number 263. And we are in the big city of Sky Valley, two words, Sky Valley, Georgia, and the zip code is 30537. Once again, 21 Berkshire, B-E-R-K-S-H-I-R-E, 21 Berkshire, lane number 263, Sky Valley, Georgia, 30537, and we shall return. This is Truth to Ponder with Bob Bierman. Privates on the winning side. Shalom Aleichem. This is the nice Jewish boy, Jonathan Kahn, your Jewish connection, bringing you the riches of your Jewish roots in Jesus. Now get your pen out as fast as you can so you don't miss out on receiving a special free gift you're going to get and love in a moment. Now, in an army, you can be many things, a private, sergeant, lieutenant, corporal, captain, major, colonel, general. Each has its own rights and status and responsibilities. But the main thing is not your rank in the army, but the army of your rank, which is better to be the general in a defeated army or a private in a victorious one. 
You might be looking at your rank in life, your status, your situation, your job, your rank in the Lord. You might not be feeling you have much rank at all, but you know what? It doesn't really matter. It's not your rank that means anything in the end, but what army you're in, what side you're on, or more importantly, whose side you're on. It doesn't matter if you're a private or a general. If you're on the winning side, you're a winner. When the victory comes, the private rejoices as much as the general. So how do you know if you're on the winning side? If you're born again, you're with God, then you're on the winning side. And if you're on the winning side, it means you're a winner. You're going to win. So it doesn't matter what's against you or how high or low your rank in life is. If you're on the winning side, you're going to win. You're a winner and you're going to rejoice. So you might as well start rejoicing now. Stop looking at your situation. Stop being intimidated by the enemy. Stop fearing and start rejoicing now because you are more than a conqueror through Messiah who loves you. You're a heavenly private on the winning side. Want more? Ask for the private and the general. Now the free gift for you. The mystery hidden for 2,000 years in the sands of Israel. Better than Raiders of the Lost Ark. And it's real. The mystery of the temple doors. You'll love it. And sapphires, your daily spiritual vitamin supply for victorious life in God. So how do you get all these free gifts? Easy. Just remember Jesus is real Hebrew name. Yeshua. And dial it. That's all you do. Just dial 1-800-YESHUA-1. You'll be so blessed. But call now. 1-800-YESHUA-1. Now I invite you to minister with me and bring the good news back to the people who gave it to you. Israel and the unreached peoples of every tribe and tongue on five continents. You'll be so blessed. Just call now. 1-800-YESHUA-1. That's Y-E-S. H-U-A-1 Or you can write me direct I'd love to hear from you Just write to the nice Jewish boy At box 1111 in Lodi L-O-D-I, New Jersey The zip 07644 It's a nice Jewish boy It's box 1111 It's in Lodi L-O-D-I, New Jersey 07644 Well, until next time This is Jonathan Kahn saying Shalom Alechem Peace be to you, my friend In Messiah Adon Olam the Lord, the General, the Commander-in-Chief of the Universe. This is Truth to Ponder with Bob Bierman. And welcome back to part two of Truth to Ponder for this Monday as we come to you from Chilhowee, Virginia. We're up visiting some family And so if the studio quality seems a little bit bit different and you got some echo on the audio is not what you're used to, it's because of our kind of temporary rigging we've set up to be on the road for just a little while. Uh, Keep us in your prayers as we spend some time here and also in producing the program. I will tell you on a personal note that lately I have been more tired than I have been in a long time. And sometimes I wonder, is it because I'm just dealing with all this stuff each and every day? It it can really wear on the soul. I I, I will have to tell you that. That Sometimes doing this program, is it's not just as easy as some people think. Oh, you're going to record a show? Yeah, you just go down and you go in your studio and an hour later you're done. It's, it's, It's not that. There's so much reading that is involved. So much trying to sort through things that are true and things that are absolutely not true and that's the hard part I see stories every day that seem at some point to be a little bit on the plausible side but I get this really bad feeling not to go there just to leave it alone don't trust it Uh, there's a number of websites and news sites that I am a member and some that I have to pay to be a member and some of the sites that I've been paying for I don't, I'm beginning to not even trust some of the things they say. They're way over the top. All they're wrangling about this out of the other, and, and I'm not going to get into some of that today. I will maybe later this week. Why there are some of these videos that people share with me that I just don't talk about. Because after I pray it through, and understand, this is a faith-based radio program. I give you the best opinion I can based on the knowledge and the things that I read, and I try to verify the credibility as best as I can. Will I make mistakes? I'm sure along the way that I will, and I probably have. But it's not by intent or design. And I'm convinced, and I'm not going to name the sites, but I'm convinced that some of the websites that I have seen over the past year and reading their stories, some of them sound great, but over time, 
it became evident they were not true or they were misleading or they were partly true. And had I followed up and shared the same information, it would have embarrassed this radio program by giving you information that is not true. When we started this program a year ago, almost a year ago, I had a lot of friends that were saying, so do you follow Q? And my answer was, no, I do not, because I had a bad feeling. And I'll be honest, my initial reaction, and I told this to somebody, I said, it, it smells like a reverse psychop, where they're going to they're going to put this stuff out there to embarrass people, and people are going to believe it, and they're going to run with it. Uh, do I believe that the insurrection, as they call it at the Capitol, was a true insurrection? Absolutely not. Do I believe it was a partially staged event or created? Yes, I do. I believe there were agents of the FBI and other groups in that crowd that already had figured and already knew how they were going to get in to bring people in to embarrass people caught in the moment because they had to undo all the damage that they had done in the stolen election, all the damage they had done in allowing this virus to come into the United States and shut down our economy to cover up their tracks like Fauci and his involvement that I shared in the first half hour of this program, or actually 38 minutes, we ran over time. And for that, I do apologize. But it had to be said. There are so many moving parts to this entire story that, you know, to say the simple story that CNN wants you to believe, that somebody in a bat cave, somewhere in the middle of China, stepped on some bat droppings in the cave. And somehow, he breathed those particles off his shoes when they went to bed that night, and he woke up with SARS-CoV-2. And he was coughing and, and feeling lousy and had a fever, and then passed it on to his friends. And then they went back to, to Wuhan with all their, their bats for the wet market, and everybody got infected, and then the world got infected. This is the nonsensical story that CNN, MSNBC, Twitter, and Facebook wanted you to believe all of last year until the evidence became so overwhelming, they couldn't lie to you anymore. And that's, what's, that's what they've done. Facebook is not a credible news source. It is nothing but pure propaganda. Things that I put on and posted last year on my personal account and my, and of course, the account for this program. Oftentimes, I would get the warning from Facebook. You can't say that. That is false information. Talking about, a you know, it came out of a lab. No, it came from a bat. It came from a bat in a cave to somebody who stepped on some bat droppings. That was the story. And if you ever deviated from that little narrative, you became, you know, you became a non-person. On Twitter, you get deplatformed if you don't repent of your sins. And Facebook just shadow bans you where people stop seeing the things you're posting. And now you have the corrupt Biden administration. He's not even in charge. He's just the figurehead. The Harris administration, whatever you want to call it. The New World Order administration the Socialist Communist Administration, the We Want to Control Every Aspect of Your Life and Track Everything You Do Administration. I mean, we're coming to this point. If you hadn't noticed it yet, technology, as I've said a thousand times, literally over all the years that I've been doing this program and the prior weekend program, I have said it over and over again. Technology is both a blessing and a curse. Absolutely a blessing and a curse. You've got the Biden administration literally telling Facebook, we want to know about those evil people like Bob Bierman who, who make statements that go against our narrative. And they're telling people like Google, we want to read the, his emails. And they're telling companies like Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile, and any of the other Sprint, any of the other mobile phone companies. We want, we want to know from algorithms and artificial intelligence what kind, of, what kind of text is Bierman sending his friends and family. It might be misinformation that needs to be corrected. Do you see where this is going? 
And the worst part is the technology already exists to do that. There are a lot of things people try to tell me that technology can do. And I, I listen to them, and then I have to shake my head and go, you're clueless. Technology can't do that, but there are a lot of things it can do. There are a lot of things that we know it can do, and those are the things that I fear the most. Those things that can be actually implemented. Those things that can be rolled out on a mass scale. Now, I'm going to get some of you mad right now, and that's all right. You know, you can get mad at me. I don't care. Remember, I come out of 40-some-odd years as a broadcast engineer, and so I understand radio frequency energy and what it can and cannot do, what some people claim it can and cannot do, versus what we know it can and cannot do. 5G is not your enemy. Starlink is not your enemy. It's not going to have a death ray to your brain and read your, your mind. There's a lot of that kind of stuff out there. And while those kind of technologies may exist at some point in the future, you can't roll them out because it is technically not feasible on that kind of a scale. And you're not going to be, and you know, these little things, they say, oh, the injection is going to put stuff in your body that's going to read your thoughts and talk to a satellite or your 5G towers. No, it is not. Stop believing this phony nonsense. This is more bizarre than Buck Rogers in the 25th century kind of stuff. But what they can do, now here's what 5G and Starlink can do. While it provides you fast, wonderful internet and streaming it, and you can play your video games faster, it moves data faster. Think about that. I was talking to a, several seasoned engineers over the last several weeks. We've known each other, and some, have, some are new friends, some are old. We talk about all this stuff about 5G. It's just wider channels that can move more data. And data is like turned on, turned off. I've told people, that when you start learning computers and data, can you count to one? Zero and one. Everything in the digital world is a zero or a one. It's not a weird death ray. It's just a sampling rate of zero to one or storage to encode something. That's simple. And to move these millions of bits of zeros and ones, the wider the channel, the faster it moves. That's why old dial-up telephones with a 3,000-cycle bandwidth could only move slow data. DSL made it faster. Your cable company is faster. Then Wi-Fi comes along. You know, 20 and 30, 40 megabits, and then 100, and now a gigabit because the channels got wider. That's all. And so don't run down the 5G rabbit hole, please. There's enough real danger out there that is when you're chasing after 5G, you are missing the real dangers that are out there. Keeping your 3G or 4G phone is not going to protect you. They can still trace your location because the GPS is still in it and towers can ping it. Not that that's the intention of the phone companies because they're just trying to sell product to make money. The real danger, you want to know who the real danger is? I'm about to tell you where the real dangers lie. It's not Verizon. It's not T-Mobile. It's not Sprint. It's not AT&T per se. They're not the real danger to you. They're selling you product with, they can do incredible things and people want all this incredible, these incredible toys and stuff. I get it. They're in the business of building out a network to make money. They have no political agenda. They have no desire to kill off half the population or three thirds, two thirds of it, whatever. This is not in their plan. That's going to kill them if they do. That'll destroy their business. They're not the enemy. What the enemy is, really, more than anybody else, is our government and some of the big social media companies, like the Googles and the Facebooks and the Twitters that are selling your information. Google being among the worst. Google knows more about you, and and now Amazon is following suit. They know all about you. You order all this stuff. You have all the Amazon toys. They know what more movies are platformed and released through Amazon 
So they know all about your personal taste, your likes and dislikes, and your information is being sold to the highest bidder, which happens to now include the United States government. All that 5G and Starlink will ever do is make some companies very wealthy, moving data around more efficiently and a whole lot quicker. So don't get all caught up in the 5G, it's a death ray, or it's going to read your thoughts. And I have friends that still believe that, and no matter how I try to convince them that is not what 5G is all about, you can't convince them. But the tech, you know, oh, but you don't understand that vaccine shot was full of all these nanobots that are going to self come together when they're in this, when they're in range of a 5G tower, they're going to start coming together like a little submarine in your bloodstream. I lit, I have people that tell me those things. Nonsense. Nonsense. But there are things about this vaccine I find very troubling. Why the rush to push something to market? And contrary to what CNN may lead you to believe, this was not invented in 11 months or 10 months. As I shared in the first half hour, this technology has been around. This whole concept goes back to 1999. The patents show the players and they are the traders and should be held accountable. I didn't expect to get into a a discussion about the deep state or SARS-CoV-2 and the media that has hidden, it has done its best to convince everybody we got to get vaccinated. We're going to talk about some of the phony numbers out there and how, you know, the old saying is statistics don't lie, but you can lie with statistics. That is so true in today's world. And that is a sad state of affairs. We have seen treason in our FBI trying to subvert a president. We've seen liars like Adam Schiff, Jerry Nadler, and others that are just trying to basically take this country into an elitist direction, and they want to be the elites to control you. Information is power. But if the information you get is not true or questionable, it can wreck your credibility. And so that's why I'm extremely cautious, as you probably have figured out, on a lot of the stuff that you send me. Because if I share it, then I am totally convinced without any doubts. If I share it with you, I feel a comfort level in sharing it with you because I know it to be most likely true. I don't see pitfalls in sharing what is apparently truth. But there have been a lot of things that have been told me over the past year that they wanted me to share on this program. I didn't, and I'm glad I didn't because, well, guess what? Guess what? They weren't true. And that's why we try to be a program to bring you truth. We're going to talk about several different things this week. I'm not sure how this week will go as we come to you from Virginia. But I want to thank those that have been writing. I'm going to try to do my best in keeping up with email on the road. And any gifts you send, we will they'll catch up to us. There'll be everything secure. Don't worry about sending anything in the mail. We'll see it next weekend. Uh, we'll see it by before the first. But keep us in your prayers. If you want to help us out, our mailing address is 21 Berkshire, B-E-R-K-S-H-I-R-E, 21 Berkshire Lane, number 263. That's number 263. We're located in the big city. (laughs) It's not a big city. Sky Valley, Georgia, and our zip code 30537. 21 Berkshire Lane, B-E-R-K-S-H-I-R-E, 21 Berkshire Lane, number 263, Sky Valley, Georgia, and our zip code 30537. And we'll see you tomorrow. This has been Truth to Ponder with Bob Bierman. To find out more, visit our website, Truth, the number two, and the word ponder.com. That's truth, the number two, ponder.com. Truth to ponder, shining the light of truth in a darkening world.